Isaiah chapter 1. Let's get into it here. Isaiah is called the preaching prophet because he's not listing out new laws. He's not describing new doctrine or new dispensations from God in that regard. Instead, he's in the context of the law to Israel, uh, preaching about how they failed to keep it and trying to motivate them to do it so they're saved from God's judgment. And so there's a lot of good preaching in here. That's why I didn't finish the chapter last week. I hope I can get through at least 10 or 12 verses tonight, if not the whole chapter. But we dropped it off in verse 10. Remember, this chapter is God's case against the nation. He sets this book up saying, I've got a charge against you people, my people, right? And he lists the charge. You guys are rebellious and you don't remember me and you, don't, you, don't, uh, you rebelled against me in verse 2. And then he talks about the sins that they have and talks about how their cities are laid waste and they're destroyed. And we talked about how that wasn't just a consequence of nature. That was because of their disobedience to the covenant. God in the covenant said, when you disobey this covenant, these things will happen. And so the testimony that their cities are desolate was saying that's happening in accordance to your disobedience. So it's not the first time they broke the law. So we covered that last week, right? It's not a first time offense. They've done it time after time after time after time. And that's where Isaiah's writing. You're a repeat offender and you're offending again. So time's up on the mercy. That's what Isaiah is saying. That's what God's saying. He calls them Sodom and Gomorrah, which is not good for Israel because Sodom and Gomorrah um, didn't exist anymore. <laughs> they got judged completely and wasted, right? And so calling Israel Sodom and Gomorrah, it's like, this, you're at the end of the rope, guys. There's no more going to come ex except for your being destroyed and taken out of the land, okay? So verse 10, he begins with this new section of chapter 1 to remind Israel of the law. Remember the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, just reading that phrase, uh, a parenthetical comment we might make is that Isaiah here is speaking for the Lord. Isaiah is writing this, but the Lord is speaking. He's speaking the Lord's words. That's the definition of inspiration and what prophets did. Prophets spoke or spokesmen for God. Okay, and so he says, hear the word of the Lord. I would never say that unless what follows is me reading scripture. Right. My words are just my words. Hopefully I can make you understand the sense of Scripture, but I'm not a prophet. This book is inspired, however. But Isaiah is writing these words, so he can say that about what he's writing. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And, of course, we know that's figure of speech because he's talking about Jerusalem and Israel earlier in the context there. Uh, so listen to the law. He's going to bring open the book of the law since he's making an accusation and a charge. Since he said, you're a repeat offender, he's going to open the book of the law and say, let's see what the law says about the situation. Let's see what the law says about where you're at and what that means, right? God is a just God. He doesn't do things out of uh, passion and fury, okay? And so the, one of the characteristics of God is that he's impassionate. And that doesn't mean he doesn't care. That means he's not uh, thrown about by fits of passion, right? He does things reasonably at all times, right? Which means even when he's angry, let's open the book of the law and see what it says about the situation so that, you know, he doesn't overjudge or over, do overkill, as the word says, uh, to judge them too much or too little. It's always in accordance to what is right. And that's God's characteristic, okay? So open the book of the law. What does it say? What is the purpose, in verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. So that's what, that's what he's opening up here and describing from the law. They're offering sacrifices to God. And he says, why are you doing this? Right? Now he's not saying that ignorant of what God said in the past. He's saying it because what God said about how they should bring these sacrifices is not how they're doing it. Thus he asks, why are you doing that? Right? It'd be almost like today in churches when you look around to see how people do church and you walk into the church and say, why are you doing that? Why are you worshiping the Lord that way? Well, shouldn't we worship the Lord? Well, not any way you want. There's a way the Bible describes that you worship the Lord, right? And that's how you should do it, right? And so it's the means and, and the reason why and the motivation for their doing it. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? Is it for entertainment, right? We might say, is it for self-pleasure? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beast. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. This is interesting. He opens the book of the law, and even though he, he mentioned before how sinful they were, 
I mentioned before how much judgment had come upon them already. He's here describing from the law the problem, and the big problem he's describing um, is a religious problem, right? He's not jumping into, well, some of you aren't keeping the Ten Commandments, right? Some of you aren't, aren't doing what the law says. He doesn't say that outright, because it's not that simple. As people are offering sacrifices, like the law said to do, but that's not all it's said to do, right? And this is always the case with religious people. They do the things they want from the Scripture, and don't do at all the Scripture, because they don't want to, or can't, or find that it condemns them. And so they do what they want, and they justify themselves by doing the certain things, so they can say, I've done what the Bible says, but they haven't done all that what the Bible says, and they haven't done all that God wants them to do, Right? And so this is always the issue. The big problem in Israel was with the religious people. In this time where they're the end of their rope, the time where they're ready for complete judgment, there's religious people abounding in Israel. Isn't that interesting? So it's not the case that, you know, cultures and societies get worse, worse, and worse, as the Bible says that they do. And by worse, it means there's less and less and less religion. That's not the case. Religion sticks around, and even in our country, where you say, well, our, our values have d been depressed in our country and, you know, been on the slide for a while. But you know how much religion's in America? A lot. There's still a lot of religious talk in America, a lot of religious actions people think that they're doing. A, a lot of patriotism, a lot of religion, culturally, cultural religion. That isn't even scriptural. It's just like a cultural fervor, you know, in the name of God. And so the, the, there's a lot of that in Israel, and he's saying, why are you doing these things? Right, who has required it? He says, bring no more vain oblations. Oblations are offerings, right? Gifts, right? And he says, give no more vain oblations, which means don't give gifts that are without meaning or empty. Like, here's a box. There's nothing in it. God said to bring gifts. So here's a gift. It's a box. And what's inside the box? There's nothing. What's the point? Why are you doing this? Well, you told us to give you gifts. Bows, wrappers, everything. Looks great. There's nothing inside, right? It's empty. Of course, this theme repeats throughout Scripture, even Jesus talking about white-walled sepulchers and things like that. People making themselves look like they're keeping the law, the letter of the law, and yet inside, they're hollow and shallow and everything else. And so this has always been a problem with humanity. God will require something in the law, and people will keep the law to the letter. And they say that as like a source of pride. I've done exactly what the Bible says, disregarding the point of it, right? Remember Jesus when he said that in Matthew 23? He says, uh, you, you tithe and you, you, you give gifts and the anise and the cumin, uh, yet you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law. You omitted the weightier matters. Remember faith, mercy, love, right? You've omitted, omitted the very things that the law taught. Um, and yet they were doing the tithing. They were doing the sacrifices. They were doing the meetings. All the meetings, they were on time and doing it. They were reading the scripture publicly. And yet they were not doing what the law said. Okay. So this is an important thing for us to learn. Look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. <clears throat> we, by the way, this section that we're studying tonight is so important for us to understand the Bible dispensationally, okay? Because we can learn, all the Bible is for our learning. We can learn about who God is and his nature and his ways. We can learn about who man is in our ways, as wicked as they are, and how we respond to things. Uh, we can learn about what's righteousness and what's wickedness. We can learn all, about that from all of Scripture. It's all for our learning. We can learn how to have hope in God who keeps his promises. We can learn not to have hope in man who pretty much doesn't keep his promises all the time. And so you, we can learn a lot of things. But not everything in the Bible describes what God is doing today with you. That's what we mean when we say we're studying the Bible dispensationally. Because even though we can learn from this section the righteousness and unrighteousness of men and the righteousness of God, his right judgment and all these things which are good for us to learn, it's not true. That we, we can't take this passage and say, this is talking about America, and God's going to judge America next week. That's not talking about America, and there's no statement of God doing that today, because he's offering grace to the world. Right? So, talking about what God is doing to us today, this will of God for us today, is a different question than, can we learn from this? Yeah, we can learn from this, but it's not speaking to, about us. Right? But a lot, you can learn a lot from listening to other people's conversations as far as that sort of thing. If you have siblings in your family or growing up, you know that's the case. Your sibling gets in trouble, and you didn't get in trouble, but you learned something. Right? That's how it is. Israel gets in trouble. We learn, read their, their history and their, their experience. We go, oh, okay, oh, I need to learn from that. But the punishment wasn't given to you. It was given to your sibling. It was given to Israel. Right? 
So we can learn stuff, but it's not written to us. Anyway, Hosea chapter 6. That's where I told you to turn, right? <clears throat> Hosea chapter 6. All of the prophets speak about these themes that Isaiah brings up here. Hosea 6, 6. I desired mercy. This is God speaking. I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Okay. Now, Christians are fond of saying culturally that God just doesn't want a head knowledge. He wants something else, right? He wants passionate worship. You know, he wants some sort of feeling from you. You know, well, there, there's a sense of truth to that and that he wants your heart. We'll cover that here in a moment. But what God says in Hosea 6 is more than your worship and burnt offerings. He wants your knowledge of him. He wants you to know who he is and to know about him and his will. Not many people dedicate themselves to that knowledge. They think that they, you know, I love God. That's enough, right? And describe to me who that God is that you love. Well, I, 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 I don't know. But you don't know him, do you? You better know who he is. And you learn this from scripture. Know what he wants you to do. You know, concern yourself with the things he's concerned with. And so he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, did God want them to sacrifice? Yes. Did he want the burnt offerings? Burnt offerings was one of the five sacrifices uh, given to Israel to provide. Burnt offerings was the one that, that exemplified people's total worship to God. It was like their all-out worship. It was the whole thing was burnt. There was nothing left over for them to eat. The whole thing was burnt. And God says, more than that, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know what my will is, and I want you to know that. That's interesting. Look at Amos chapter 5, verse 21. Amos chapter 5. Turn to the right just a few pages there. That's 521. Here again, God is speaking. The Bible is God's love letter, people say. And yet people don't read the minor prophets because very few places, the minor prophets, do you read about that sort of uh, love that they're talking about? The first two words in Amos 521 are what? This is from God's lips. I hate. I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies, because in their solemn assemblies they were given incense and smells and stuff, right? Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Even when they said, hey, we want peace, we're going to reconcile them. I'm not going to take it. Don't want it. Irreconcilable, right? Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. Imagine the situation. People are singing to the Lord. And he says, I don't want to hear it. How, why wouldn't God want to hear people singing to him? Right? But we'll see why here in a bit. There's a, a good reason why. Because he doesn't just hear and see the outside. Remember what the Bible says about God? He knows the thoughts and intents of hearts, not just the outside. So when he sees things on the outside going, I hear the singing, I see what they're doing, but I also see their heart and it's disgusting. Right? And so he says, I don't want it. Stop singing, right? It's interesting. So this is really condemnatory right, towards us as a humanity, Israel specifically. But to all of us, we can learn from this, going, wow, if God can really see my heart beyond even just what I'm saying and how I'm looking on the outside, then I'm hopeless, folks. You know, we're hopeless. You know, we need something else than just what kind of sacrifice do I offer? You know, we need something deeper, something else. And this, of course, is supposed to point us to the need for grace, right? But uh, meanwhile, Amos 5.21 is really... Strict here. Verse 24 says, Let judgment run down as waters and righteous as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? And uh, he says, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and tuned your images, the, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore, I cause you to go to captivity. He's talking to Israel here, how they've worshipped other gods and have borne the star of their God, which is interesting. Another study I don't have time for tonight, but Israel today, the symbol of Israel is that star, you know? And there's nothing in the Bible that says that that star is the symbol of Israel. Nothing. There is something in the Bible that says Israel takes a star of a false god. Now, is the star today the star of a false god? I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't alive during that time, but I can't read anything in the Bible that tells Israel, put a star on your flag. I can read condemnation of a star they're carrying around. Whatever that means, you know, one thing or another. It's not about flags, folks. It's about worshiping God, right? And we know Israel today, of course, rejects Jesus and re rejects the scripture thereby. So let's look at um, Exodus 35. Exodus 35. We're doing a lot more page turning with Isaiah than we do with Paul's epistles. And that's because what Paul preached about, spoke about, 
mostly, not entirely, but mostly, was a mystery kept secret since the world began. What Isaiah is speaking about is what had been spoken since the world began in the Law and the Prophets. In Exodus chapter 35, verse 29, one of the things that is a failure of people to either communicate the Bible or to understand the Bible is the idea, the superficial idea, that the Old Testament was all about you doing things and the New Testament is all about the heart. You ever heard this kind of concept? The Old Covenant was about you doing things. The, Old, the New Testament is all about your heart changed to God. Not true. Okay, and I'm not saying God doesn't want your heart. I am saying that. I'm saying that, that separation is not right. The Old Testament cared just as much about their hearts as the New Testament. That's not the difference. Is one's a heart and one's on the external. Right? Now, it is true in the Old Testament, there's a lot of condemnation about their external because the law, when it required you to do things, really makes it clear that I'm going to require you to do things. And when people did them but didn't have the heart, that makes it very clear that they're hypocrites. Right? But you know, the New Testament, the New Covenant requires things too. Right? The New Covenant, of course, deals with people's hearts in a more effective way because the law was totally ineffective to change people's hearts, and that's true. But it's not true that the Old Covenant didn't care about people's hearts. Look at Exodus 35. The book of Exodus is the giving of the law to Moses, Mount Sinai, right? So this is the Old Covenant right here. And it says in Exodus 35, verse 29, The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. The tabernacle that God told Moses to build, he describes it, and I can't read the whole chapter, but it's worthy of you reading it. But back up in verse 5. Take ye from amongst you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold, silver, and brass. And he describes, take a, a free will offering of gold, silver, and brass, and use that gold, silver, and brass to build my tabernacle. And then verse 20, 29, or 25 was that they actually did it. They gave a free will offering as their heart willed, and they built the tabernacle from a free will offering. God said to build the tabernacle, but he said it was going to be built with people who willingly gave the, the, the supplies for it. Isn't that interesting? And that was the tabernacle of the Old Covenant, right? So it was built on this willingness and a willing heart, right? Now, what do we know about men's hearts? They're wicked above all things. So on one day, they might will, and what happens the next day? They don't will, you yeah. know? That's the problem with men. They might will on Sunday and not will on Monday. They might will for an hour and not will the next hour. They're wicked. That's what that means is they're back and forth. They're crooked. It's not always true that every, everyone's either all right or all bad. Hmm? You find this to be true in yourself? You find like your spiritual life goes up and down? Like one day I'm really loving the Lord and the next day it's like, okay, I need to get back, you know, I'm doing stuff. You're wicked. That's what wickedness looks like, right? Nexus 35, the old covenant began with a willing heart. It had to. And they did. Okay, look at Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus is the book talking about those sacrifices, all these sacrifices that God said, I hate and despise the way you're bringing them. What purpose are you bringing these sacrifices for, these vain oblations? The answer might be, well, God, you, you told us to. You, you told us to bring these sacrifices. You told us to bring these offerings. You told us to sing these songs, right? Well, look at Leviticus. This is what God's saying, Leviticus 1 verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and the flock. Notice the, 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 the word at the beginning of this admonition. Speak unto the children of Israel. What's the first word? If any man bring an offering. He doesn't say every man should bring an offering. Here. Here he says, if a man bring an offering, this is how it should be brought. It should be, what's he say? Of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock, Right? So, do you remember Cain and Abel? Why didn't God not like Cain's sacrifice, but he liked Abel's sacrifice, is everyone's question. Because there was a way God instructed them to bring their offerings. And Abel brought it according to God's instructions. Cain brought it according to what he thought was better. And God says, I don't want it, which made Cain upset. Why don't you want it? I worked hard for this. And God says, that's the whole point. <laughs> you worked hard for it. Yeah, that's kind of the spiritual point. I don't want your achievements, right? I want it to be... What I made, which was the, the blood of, of animals, is what Abel offered, right? That's what God says here, too. But he says, if you bring it, bring it this way. So you see, it wasn't that they were bringing the sacrifices, they weren't bringing the right way. Let's continue in verse 3. If his offering be a burnt uh, sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. You see that? Burnt offerings were voluntary. 
You aren't required to bring them. But what happens in a culture, tradition, and society in which burnt offerings are seen as the complete and total worship of God, and you want to be someone seen as the one who worships God entirely, you're going to bring a burnt offering, right? Because then everyone sees, look, burnt offering, I'm offering it, and oh, that guy's devout, right? But what does God see? Your heart. So if you don't bring the offering, it doesn't match what the offering was intended to represent from your heart, there's a problem. If you didn't actually completely worship God and serve him and give him your all that was required, and you offer the burnt offering willingly, right? God knows the true will of your heart, which was to be self, uh, you know, self-glorifying, or maybe to self-justify and self-righteous. You see, but you see the voluntary will? You don't, we don't always think of the law being voluntary. This is. Now, there are other laws, don't get me wrong. There are laws that were required, not voluntary, but these things here are voluntary, burnt offerings. That's why he says, why are you bringing these? They're voluntary, why don't you just stay home? Well, if I do that, people think that I'm not religious. God says, yep, that would be honest. <laughs> It'd be more honest of you to stay home than to bring that burnt offering, because I know your heart, right? You've heard me say something similar to that today, and I, I hate to uh, advise people to do, to do wrong, but under grace, you're not required to give money. You're not required to be here. You're not required by God. It's not like there's some law under grace that if you don't come to church, you don't get blessed. By grace, you get all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, verse 3. By grace, you're saved already. You don't have to be here to get saved. You're saved already if you trust the gospel of grace, right? And you have all spiritual blessings. So if you're not here for the reason of trying to grow in the Lord and edify one another and strengthen yourself by the scripture, then, you know, stay home. What's the point? Why are you here, right? Well, I, I, I think I need to come to church every Sunday. You heard this idea, right? We need people to go to church. Yes, we do. I agree. But it's not just going to church, right? It's the reason why they're going to church. I've seen people come to church. Here, this church. People bring people or force their kids or <laughs> they come here. And this just happens. You know, you come and you know that they don't want to be here. I can see it on their face. You know, that they don't want to be here. And sometimes you force your kids because you want to try to train them in the Lord. But other times you're like, why in the world are you here? You know, now again, I'm not, I hope you're here. I want you to come. You know, I really do. You know, but it should be with the right heart, right? But this has been a perpetual problem. It's not just a, a problem in this dispensation. It's been a constant problem for mankind. And this is what Isaiah is pointing out. The law sh brings the knowledge of sin. That's what the law does. And under the law, Isaiah is pointing out the problem. It's not that you have a temple and that you have meetings and you have sacrifice and you have worship. The problem is your heart. Now, what do you and I know when we are condemned of our sin? How shall we respond to God when we realize that we're not righteous and, and none of us are righteous? How shall we respond to God? Do we respond to God with, all right, God, I'll double down and do twice as much tithing and twice as much works? You failed the first time. What makes you think you're going to do better the second time? Right? How they should respond, how Israel should have responded, and how we should respond is, I can't do it, God. I need your help to help me do it because I, I can't do it. My heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9, and you're going to have to do something. Right? Isn't that what Israel should have done? And didn't God have a plan to provide for something like that? That he would provide their salvation? Exactly, right? So the heart is the issue here. Leviticus, from Leviticus chapter 22, verse 18. Leviticus 22, talking about the priests. Leviticus 22, in verse 18. Speak unto Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel that will offer his oblation for all his vows and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer to the Lord for a burnt, burnt offering, ye shall offer at your own will a man without blemish. You see that? Over and over again, God says it in the law. Offer it of your own will. Why are you doing this? Well, the priest told me to. <laughs> He said, if I don't do this, then, you know, I'm not going to be blessed, and I really want that blessing. The sacrifice was supposed to be an acknowledgement of your sin, an acknowledgement that I worship God with my whole heart, you know. Just don't do it because the priest said to do it. That's the wrong attitude, right? In the same way, imagine the corruption that can enter religion when you realize that in this priest system, that the priests actually, on many sacrifices, got part of the sacrifice. Remember that the Levites didn't have land of their own, right? And so when someone brought a, a, a sin sacrifice, for example, sin offering, uh, they'd burn half of it, and the other half the priest would keep, as you know, God said the priest could have that part as part of their payment, right, for offering, doing the, the service, right? And so is it in the priest's self-interest, 
for people not to give sacrifices or to give sacrifices. They want more sacrifices given because they get a part of it, right? How do you apply that to church today? Again, this isn't talking to us, but we're learning a lot here from it, right? Is it in pastor's self-interest to get more people or less people to church? More. Why? Because they get more money. I mean, and I'm not saying pastors are greedy. It's just this self-interest, right? If you're teaching that if you're here, we all need to support and provide financially, I mean, churches do, then it's defeating. There, there's a tug in your own self against the idea that if I teach something and I lose half the people, I've lost half my income. That's just how it is. There's, so there's going to be this resistance. So this is why the religious teaching, the religious system, even of well-intended people, doesn't work. It shows corruption. Because on the giver and the receiver, there's a potential for error. And flesh is, is, is mistaken. Flesh is wrong. This just happens frequently. And people wonder, well, how possibly can it be that these, these televangelists, you know, get so much money? Who are these stupid people giving money to these televangelists? And why do they keep doing it? They sound so stupid, you know. Why? Because they get money and the other people think they get blessings. I mean, there's a whole system that works out mutually for both of them. But the problem is, is the truth. <laughs> it's doctrinally wrong, you know. So there's things that you can communicate and teach in churches that will really shrink your church. You know, if you, if you want to think about ways to keep your church uh, around the size of coronavirus guidelines, you can. You just preach some things hard and true and keep doing it, and then people will leave, you know. That's what happens. I, I need to stop preaching and get to the text here. Let's look at Leviticus chapter uh, 23, verse 38. Leviticus 23, 38. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside your vows, and beside all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord, he says, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And this feast here, what they're going to provide there is going to be voluntary. So you had these feast days, and what they offered on the feast day was a voluntary thing. Now they had to keep the day, but then it's like there's a voluntary part to it, Right? It's kind of like how people do that today. Well, I, I can't get into that anymore. Well, let, let's look at um, <clears throat> Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, 18. The Bible is very hard toward humanity. So it really takes a humility of heart, a, an, a willingness to know that I am wrong and God is right. Or you come to this book and you're going to feel really depressed in some parts. Because it's all about you being wrong and you doing things wrong and Israel's doing something wrong and we're wicked. You know? Where's the good parts? Where's the stuff where I get a bunch of things? You know, well that, that's grace and that's glory. But you don't get the grace and glory and you don't appreciate that unless you first understand that you're not righteous. That's God's whole principle, right? But in Psalms chapter 34, God has always wanted men's hearts, even out of the Old Testament. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. If he's near you that have a broken heart, near David here has a broken heart, then when is he not near David? When his heart's not broken. When his heart is not contrite. Right? Under the covenant, that was the system. God will be near you if you had a broken heart, and away from you if you didn't. Now what do you know, according to the doctrines of grace, how God operates to you? Today, if you were not having a broken heart, did not walk charitably, did not do things willingly to help other people or God, if you're saved by God's grace, where does God dwell? What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 3.16? Know ye not, carnal, filthy, sinning Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? How does he dwell in the Corinthians? They were carnal. Because by grace, it's not by what they do. So today, not under the covenant, not under the law, God's operating differently. You get saved by grace, and you get saved, you get crucified, and you get resurrected, you get saved, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So there's, there's no reason to think Psalm 34 is dealing with you, it's dealing with David. The principle is right, is that your heart should be right. But praise God by His grace, even when you don't do right today, by His grace, His Spirit still dwells in you. And that was Paul's motivation for them to do right. Don't you know the Spirit hasn't left you, so you should really do right? That was the motivation under grace. Back here is, you better do right or the Spirit's going to leave you. That's covenant. That's conditional. Grace is not that. Same principle, though, right? 
do right. Right? Get your heart right. That's the idea. So the Old Testament had the same heart focus as the New Testament. Look at Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. I, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do the will of God, the will of my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. You see the issue? David here is writing and he's, talk, or he's talking about his heart, having the law in his heart. It's not just that he has to do it, it's that he wants to do it. That sounds like New Testament. Well, it is quoted in the New Testament, but it's written in the Old Testament. It's written under the law. Okay? At all times, God was trying to deal with men's hearts. It's just that the law of Moses had no power to change men's hearts, just to condemn them, right? And to show them what was right. Psalm 51, verse 17. My point is that you can go back there and learn about the love of God just as much in the Old Covenant as you can in the New, folks. Love of God is on every page of the Scripture when you understand why God's judging them, right? But it's not the love of God people want. People interpret the love of God as be nice to me all the time and don't say anything bad about me or other people. Well, <laughs> that's not the way God shows love. God shows love this way. You're wrong. Here's what right is. We're going to crunch you and break off that arm and branch until you conform to what's right. That's what God's love is. Because he knows that what is right is good for you. And what is wrong is bad for you. So he will do everything, even die on a cross, to get you right. Right? Psalm 51, verse 17. And by the way, he gets you right by the cross, not by your works. Right? It's by his. It's grace. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. Remember in Amos and Isaiah, I despise your offerings, I hate your sacrifices. Psalm 51, if you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, you will not despise it. See, that was what they were missing. That's what was missing from the sacrifices, okay? So, is it getting redundant yet? Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, what was the law teaching? Deuteronomy 6 is the listing of the Ten Commandments back there. This is what's called the Shema, or the beginning of the law. And in Israel and Jews will quote this as like the, the penultimate law in their Jewish system. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine, you know the verse because it's quoted by Jesus. Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. That was the first and greatest commandment. So you see how it's wrong that the Old Covenant didn't care about people's hearts? It did. The law itself was written in black and white. Love God with all your heart all your mind, with all your soul. The Old Covenant spoke about the inner man. The problem with the Old Covenant wasn't that it didn't speak about the inner man, it was that it had no power to change the inner man. What was wicked was wicked, right? And all man was wicked. But you very clearly see what the law requires, a perfect, contrite, broken, heart full of love towards God. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. People think, well, the Old Covenant had physical circumcision. The New Covenant is circumcision of the heart. Well, um, think about that for a second. In fact, read about that for a second. You heard about circumcision of the heart, right? What's that mean? It's not just the physical things. That you, it's, the, it's the heart that you've got to circumcise to love God, right? To separate yourself from the evils of the world and from sin and whatever in the flesh, right? Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. This is the law of Moses, the Old Covenant. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. That was a law in the Old Covenant. You're required to. That's not a New Covenant teaching, folks. It's, a new, it's an Old Covenant teaching. What's the difference between the Old Covenant and New Covenant? The Old Covenant required you do it even when you couldn't. The New Covenant says, if you can't do it, I'll do it for you. So in the New Covenant, Jesus says, I'll circumcise your heart. The Old Covenant was, you need to circumcise your heart. See the difference? It's who's doing it. Now, under grace, circumcision isn't even an issue for you. Not even the circumcision of your heart. You say, well, doesn't, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make sense because under this station of grace, it's not about your flesh being reformed. It's about you being killed with Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ, and now the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's His life you're living. Colossians 2 talks about your circumcision being one made without hands, but it's the circumcision of Christ. It's the cutting off of the whole body of this flesh, not just your heart. The whole thing is cut off. You're crucified. That's the grace teaching. 
So the old covenant was circumcise your heart so that your will is right. The new covenant says, since you can't do it, I'll do it for you to circumcise your heart so your will is right. So the new covenant will give them that Holy Spirit to empower them to do right. But grace says, we're just going to kill these people, they're worthless, and make them new, right? And put them in Christ. So it's Christ's head and it's Christ's heart. Isn't that what we preach? The heart and love of Christ to have died for us. That's what we're preaching. We're not preaching today, look at how my heart is circumcised now. We're preaching the love of God toward us. That's the grace preaching. Isn't it interesting? So under all the law and the prophets, God focuses the attention, tries to focus the attention on the heart, on the inner man. And then in the new covenant, and by grace, he reveals, look, God became perfect man to do what you could never do. Right? Anyway, I, I can't lay out all these comparisons, but that's what we're getting at. Look at Jeremiah 4, verse 14. Jeremiah 4. <clears throat> salvation's a hard issue, folks. It's not what you do. That's why salvation is by faith. It's never by religion, even under the Old Covenant. There were things they had to do, but it was by faith, not by what they did. Jeremiah 4, verse 14. O Jer Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shalt thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Wash your hearts that thou might be saved. Salvation's a hard issue. He so said, we've washed our bodies. You know how many baptisms they've been through and how many washings they perform? So many washings of baptism in the Old Testament. And they did them all. They were doing them. And God says, it's not the external, it's the internal, right? It's the heart. That's the issue. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 21. You've heard preachers preach on these verses? They do. And they preach on them and they preach a the right thing about the importance of your heart and belief and faith. And the wrong thing that they do is say that they're talking about you. And then they missed the greater blessings of grace. Jeremiah was talking to Jerusalem, not you, right? Isaiah's talking to Israel, not you. And that has ramifications, but we can learn something from these things, certainly. Jeremiah 7, 21. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded I, them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well within you. But they hearkened not in their, in, uh, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward. You see? It's the same thing here in Jeremiah 7. I didn't command them to do these burnt offerings. I told them to obey me. And they said, we are. We're giving you the burnt offerings. That wasn't the obedience. The obedience was their heart willingness. Right? Was their love toward God. The first sacrifice, that's, that's the sepulcher that you offer the offering in. You know, they were offering empty containers, empty gifts, vain oblations. Right? That was the big issue. By the way, look at Romans 2.28. i got to show you this because people are confused by this quite a bit. We covered this back in the fall, and I want to hit it again just so that we can get it ingrained in our mind. This is Pauline material in Romans 2.28. Remember this teaching? He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not a man, but of God. Now, with the light of all the verses we just read in the Old Covenant, do you understand what those verses say? I hope you do. He's, this is not New Testament. This is not mystery. This is not even like new information to Paul. He is teaching Old Testament truth, Romans 2, 28 and 29. He's teaching the same thing Isaiah teaches, same thing as David teaches to Israel, because Romans 2 is talking about Israel. Paul's talking about Israel and saying, you guys can't even keep the law. Read the prophets. And he says, here's the truth. You're not a Jew just because you're one outwardly. You're a Jew by one inwardly. The law says that, right? And what's he conclude in Romans 3? There's none righteous. That's the conclusion. Even you who have the law can't even keep it. He is not teaching here that it used to be you're a Jew in the flesh, and now we're all spiritual Jews who believe in Jesus. That's not the teaching. The teaching is Old Testament teaching in Romans 2, 28, 29. There's no church back there, church of the body of Christ. He's talking about Jews, right? So that should help you there. This is law, Romans 2, 28, 29. Because it's not just the empty sepulcher. And even when you talk about their heart being circumcised, how many have circumcised hearts? Narrow one, Right? So this really brings people to the bottom of the barrel so Paul can finally say, but now it's not what you do, inwardly or outwardly. It's what Christ did. 
That's Romans 3. That is grace. Okay? And so this is why Romans 3.31, Paul can say, do we then make void the law through faith? Does faith, does the heart issue make the law void? Is the law and faith contrary to each other? What's the answer? Of course not. The law was teaching you to love in your heart, to do it willingly in your heart, to do it, change your heart, right? And that's what they all missed. The faith, the mercy, the love, they missed that. They thought it was just the doing of the things, right? So Paul uses the law to show people the need for faith and to bring them to the grace of Christ, right? Because he did the work that they couldn't do. Does that make sense? Now, some people think back here in Isaiah, when he says, when Isaiah's teaching, why are you bringing these sacrifices, and I hate these things, they think that Isaiah's teaching Pauline grace. They think Isaiah's teaching, you're not under the law anymore, guys. I told you before, but now don't do that. So Isaiah's revealing the salvation truth that you're not under the law anymore. That's not what Isaiah's doing. Okay, we'll read uh, next week, or a couple weeks from now, Isaiah 2, about how in Jerusalem, the law would be taught. Isaiah's not removing the law. He's actually teaching the true purpose of the law which is, it's a heart problem, right? People think Isaiah is teaching Paul. He's not. We see how Paul uses law, and Isaiah is not teaching Paul, okay? Paul's got something else to say beyond just what the law revealed, okay? So what we're learning in Isaiah here is that God hates empty religion, okay? He hates that. And uh, even under grace, he hates that. He hates people who uh, say one thing and do another, he says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, don't give unless you give as you purpose in your heart. Remember that? That's the grace principle. From so the grace principle, he says it outright. He says, don't even give. There's no law of tithing, of course, but also even in generous giving, don't give unless you purpose in your heart. That's an offense always to God. If you're giving just to look generous and don't really purpose in your heart, it's vanity. Don't even do it. Right? If you're only showing up to church for vain reasons, don't do it. Right? Do it because you realize the purpose of, of the benefit of, of doing right. Okay? And that's the grace principle. People get offended when we say, well, don't tithe, you should give. And they say, well, why shouldn't I tithe? A lot of people are in a system of, if I do this thing, I get a blessing. Grace says you get the blessings freely. Stop trying to do it for the blessing. Do it because your heart purposes it. Right? Grace will change your heart. Anyway, look at Isaiah chapter 1, down in verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I can not away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. He's saying, he's, just, he, he's talking about every religious thing they do. There's nothing they do religiously if done with a wrong heart that means anything to God. Right? All the sacrifices and offerings, all of your meetings, all of your temples, even the highest, holiest meetings are meaningless. Even the high priest and what he does in the temple is meaningless if he doesn't do it with the right heart. You see the vanity of religion, right? That God's even pointing out. Okay? Down verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. Just stop is what he's saying. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Well, their hands are full of blood in two ways. One way in that they're offering bloody sacrifices. They think for the Lord, but God knows their heart. So it's just vanity. They're killing animals for no reason because they have no heart intent for actually offering the offering. They're just shedding blood. Right? For no reason. So they're murdering animals, not doing it for the sacrifice that was intended. Okay? So you see how God's teaching a love for animals here. But secondly, they're actually murdering people. I told you before how many kings in Israel's line killed the previous king just to become king. You know? And priests had blood on their hands. Like they're, they're actually killing people in the name of the law. And you can go back there and study the history, but... So there's blood on their hands there. But the important point of verse 15 is God says, I will not open my eyes to you. I will not hear your prayers. People have the same worry today. We can learn here that wickedness is wrong and God hates it. We can learn here that there's a right attitude and heart to approach God. But if you think that God is going to uh, approach you the same way he's approaching these people under the covenant, you're dispensationally incorrect. Because God has revealed something else, changing the way he operates with humanity. He's no longer operating you in a covenant system. He's not saying, if you do bad, I won't hear your prayers. But he did say that before. And so people think that today, uh, the, the virus and things happening. There have been people already, they come out every crisis and say that this is God's judgment on America, right? Um, wh why do you think that? You say, the scripture talks about it. Yeah, the scripture talks about God's judgment against Israel. It says today God's giving grace to a world that sinners, the world of sinners, God's giving grace to the world of sinners. So if God's giving grace, which means he's not looking at what you do, good or bad, but he's doing it freely based on Christ's work, to the whole world, what can the world do 
for God not to give grace to it. You got to think through that. There's nothing the world can do. Now, that doesn't mean it's not wicked. It's just that since he's giving grace to the world of sinners, there's nothing we can do to change his giving of grace. Now, you got to understand his giving of grace. It doesn't mean everyone gets a miracle and everyone gets, you know, a free pass. I mean, you reap what you sow, right? God says that. But grace is offered to the worst sinner today and the, the best sinner, if that's even a thing. Grace is offered to all, right? And so there's, there's a reason to point out right and wrong today. But today, God's not judging it. And people ask, why doesn't God intervene? Because of his grace. Why doesn't God stop this coronavirus? Because of his grace. Because grace? People are dying. Yeah, but if he looks at certain people and say, well, that was a really good person in their life and they don't deserve to die this way. And so I'm going to, you know, what are they doing? They're judging that person's works as good and giving them a reward based on their works, right? That's not grace. Because if, he, if we're honest with ourselves, none of us are righteous. Or looking at someone else and saying, well, he's a really wicked person. He deserves the coronavirus. I'm going to kill him. What's God doing? He's looking at their works and judging them accordingly. You see, that sort of operation with God is different than God saying, everyone's a sinner, but I'm offering grace to all. The grace he provides is not healing from the virus. The grace he provides is salvation in Christ Jesus. Okay, and everyone, whether they've done good or bad, who is dying from the coronavirus, can have hope in the Lord that if they die, they can have resurrected glory by faith and grace, right? So that's, that's what he's offering, okay? But Isaiah chapter 1 here, these people under the covenant, it was the case that if they broke the covenant, God would judge them based on what they did or didn't do, right? Because that's what the covenant said he would do, right? So he says, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood, Okay? And so you see this in the scripture. In Jeremiah 11, verse four, uh, uh, 14, uh, you see one example of this. <clears throat> Where people pray. And again, recognize the situation here. This is a religious activity. I mean, it's hard enough to get people to pray, period. Right? These are people that are actually praying. And so isn't God just happy that they're praying? Instead, God says, no, I'm not going to hear it if you're not doing it right, if you're not praying with the right heart. You see, God is perfectly righteous, folks. He's not just like satisfied with some van vanity of flesh that you offer up to him, even if it is religious. Jeremiah 11, verse 14. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. Wow. If we were living under the covenant okay, and God was judging us for our sins, then we could say, don't dare pray for those people. They're getting what they deserve, right? Don't pray for that guy. He's getting what he deserves, right? We could say that under the covenant system, but we can't say that under grace because none of us are getting what we deserve under grace, whether it be good or bad. We're being offered eternal life and all blessings, and we're not being judged. So either way, we're not getting what we deserve under grace. That's what grace means. You don't get what you deserve, okay? Under the covenant, they were, which means they could pray and heavens would be like brass. It would not get through the clouds, right? Lamentations, uh, Lamentations 3.44 says that. It, prayers won't get through the clouds. Look at Psalm 66, verse 18. Do you see how this is kind of scary, folks, under the covenant system? It's kind of scary because you're like, even if I'm hurting under the covenant system, if I didn't have a right heart, God wouldn't hear me and even God wouldn't help me, right? It's kind of scary. That's the covenant, is pointing out your sin. Okay? Now, the problem, the, the, there was a solution to this under the law. The solution was contrite heart, broken heart, right? Contrite spirit, broken heart. Because David sinned, he did wrong, and yet he was forgiven, right? Why? Broken heart, contrite spirit. The law says if you confess your sins, God is merciful and just to forgive your sins. That's what the law taught. So, wait a minute, in that New Testament? Yeah, it is. That's what the law taught, too. Leviticus 26, verse 40. Right? If they would confess their sins with a broken heart to God, God was merciful all through the Old Testament. It was always a heart issue. Right? But the fact that, that he would not be merciful if they didn't meant that it was not of grace. It was covenantal. Psalm 66 verse 18 is what I want. He says, If I regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. All right, so David's thankful here, but he's simply pointing out that if there was iniquity in my heart, he wouldn't hear me. Right? Um, 
I, I, man, I'm glad for God's grace today. Because if I had to count the covenant, a lot of my prayers aren't getting through, folks. Right? By God's grace, he hears all your prayers today. Uh, it just may be your prayers don't get answered the way you want. See, the, the bad side of the covenant is may not hear your prayer. The good side of the covenant is when you pray, you get what you ask. Right? The good thing of grace is he hears all your prayers. The bad thing of grace is you may not get what you ask because he's, he's got his purpose he's doing. You don't have a covenant to bind him. You don't say, God, I'm doing good. you got to do it. You can't do that under grace because there's no covenant with you. But he'll get his purpose done. Okay. You can make your request made known to God. Pray what you will to him. And the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the prayer promise you have. Psalm 80. And peace, folks, especially during the fear that's going on today, peace is a good thing to have. Okay, that's a, that's a good blessing to have. Psalm 80 in verse 4. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and givest them tears to drink in great measure. You see, God wants people's hearts. He's not even moved by wicked men's tears, right? It's not because he's cruel. It's because he's righteous. Okay, it's a different thing. Jesus taught the same thing. In Matthew 5, he taught in the Sermon on the Mount that if you're there in the temple and you got your offering and yet you've got ought against your brother, right? What's he say to do? Drop your offering and get right. Right? Remember he said that? Go and get right with your brother. Don't offer that offering until you do so. Because what God hates is you offered an offering and you don't got things right. Right? You learn that from the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 24. Get your heart right. Right? In James 5, 16, what does James teach about the prayer of a righteous man? It avails much of a righteous man. Is there any righteous today in the cessation of grace? Nope. <laughs> That's going to be a hard prayer promise for you to claim. Well, I'm righteous. Went to church this Sunday, and that avails much. Well, what if you just count on God to do his purpose, and it abounds over all you can ask or think, and that you declare yourself not righteous except by faith in Christ Jesus? Right? But James 5 is quoting the same thing Jesus did, which is a law, prayer, covenant promise. 1 Peter 3.7, he's talking about wives and husbands, and he's warning husbands. Peter, of course, being an apostle of Israel under the covenants, him being under the new covenant, but still under that law covenant. The new covenant, folks, was the law in their hearts. It's still law. It's just law in their hearts, which was the right way to, to do the law. In 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Heard that one? Husbands, love your wives, or God's not going to listen to your prayers. Well, that really gets husbands moving, you know, because <laughs> it's, like, it's like spank time, you know. You get something taken away from you. But that's not grace teaching, folks. That's law teaching. That's if you don't love your wife good enough, God's going to hate you. That's not grace. That's covenant. Now, it may be right. I mean, you don't deserve it, right? That's righteous, but it's not grace. Under grace, even though you could be carnal and Corinthian, God dwells in you if you're saved. And he hears everything and, thinks, and knows every thought that you have. And every thought and action you have can grieve the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, which should motivate you to do right because of that reason. Right? So anyway, moving on here to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. There's a plea here. After he opens the book of the law and says, look, this is the big problem that the law condemns your heart and the law condemns the real purpose of, of why um, you know, this judgment's going to come. In verse 16, here's what you can do according to the law. So the law condemns you, but the law tells you this is what you can do. And God's going to plead with them to do this thing the law says that is right, which is to wash ye, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. That's the law, folks. All good things. And all things we should do, and all things Israel is required to do to receive the blessings of the covenant. Wash ye, make you clean. Those are, aren't saying the same thing, by the way. They're slightly different. Uh, washing is what happens when you pour water on yourself. Okay, when you wash the external, you wash your skin. But does that make you clean? Well, you say, it makes my skin clean. Yeah, but what did we just talk about? <laughs> your skin's not the issue. It's something on the inside, right? And so how in the world do you deal with your heart? Well, that's what the make yourself clean deals with, right? Wash yourself. That's outward. Make yourself clean, right? If you're a shoe, you can wash your shoe and it's going to get dirty the next time you take a step because shoes play around in the dirt, right? They're walking on the ground. So don't make yourself a shoe. Make yourself something else, right? Make yourself clean. 
right? Wash yourself and make yourself clean. Inward and outward was the issue. And um, by the way, this tells you here also that Isaiah is not giving up the law. The law dealt with washings, right? Wash yourself, also make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Interesting. When the prophets prophesied judgment to come, it was always for the purpose of getting people to do right now. Okay, the, the prophets were never saying, you're going to die in judgment just for the sake of you know, condemning people in their fate. Okay? It was always with an admonition to do right. There's always a way for God to save people from the judgment he's going to give. That's what I'm trying to say. Even when they're past the, 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 the time of no return, the judgment's going to happen, even still, people in the nation can repent right, and seek God's mercy, and God would bless them individually, right? Because everyone still had to face God when they die, you know. So there's that issue there. Even in the tribulation, he applies to the future tribulation that God's going to bring on the earth. That tribulation's a time of trouble like the earth's never seen. But even that time of tribulation, God's going to call on people to repent, right? And there's a way that people can be saved in, in that tribulation. They may have to die in it, but they could be saved from eternal judgment, right? And so you have that. Isaiah 116 says, plead, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. They needed to clean themselves, then they needed to reform themselves, right? They weren't doing things right, they needed to do things right now. They needed to learn to do well. They needed to seek judgment. They didn't know how to do right, they weren't considering things of God, but they needed to learn those things. The third thing they needed to do was restitution. Look at Micah chapter 6. Micah was a prophet prophesying at the same time as Isaiah. In fact, Micah 1, if you remember Isaiah 1, he says Isaiah prophesies in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, right? Micah, Micah 1 once is the same thing, and prophesying in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. But Micah chapter 6, in verse uh, 6, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see the question he's asking? Remember the same context Isaiah's writing. How shall I approach the most high holy God? Shall it be with a thousand, ten thousand rams? What's going to be the answer to the rhetorical question? God doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants something else. Micah 6 verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. What doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Humble yourselves, pray, confess your sins, and God will heal your land. Does that sound familiar? 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, right? 2 Chronicles dealing with the time of God's judgment on Israel. That's how they had to respond positively, right? America, everyone in America, can get down on their knees and confess their sins, okay? And we could still have a recession, the coronavirus will still be here, folks, because there's no covenant promise on this country. Now, would it be good if everyone confessed their sins? Yes. And what would be better than that is if they trusted the finished work of Christ. That would be awesome. And if everyone in America did that, there would still be a flu next winter. Okay? Because there always is. Right? Not until the kingdom come will those things get taken away. You see, salvation for you today does not change the earthly circumstances that you're in. Right? For them, however, under the covenant, God promised them a land and a nation and a blessing and fruit and healing. And so when that nation repented, God could give their fruit trees fruit and can bring rivers to their land, make the grass grow and everything else. Okay. Now God's going to bring that, all those miracles to come to pass. That thing's still going to happen on the earth, just not going to happen in this dispensation. You're going to be in glory by that time. You're going to forget all about that because you'll have all the glory that abounds over all the suffering you faced every day of your life. Okay. What God's trying to teach us today is that we operate and live with the right heart. And the right heart isn't trying to change your circumstances, it's changing how you respond to your circumstances. Right? When you're faced with poor, horrible, evil circumstances like what we're facing today with the coronavirus. Okay? The solution people need is to respond with the right heart to it. Right? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, right? And the way you respond to it is that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience 
hope because you're trusting God through this experience. And as we get through this coronavirus fear, trusting God in his grace, not to take it away, but give us the strength to live through it and encourage and love one another despite it, and maybe even help people who are sick and dying and get them saved through it. When we come out the other end, we'll have experience of having gone through these tribulations once again and having hope that God does take away our fear and God does give us strength and peace. So the next time we can tell people who are younger than us or ourselves that God gives us strength through his grace. His grace is sufficient, right? Tribulational experience, experience, hope. That's, that's how we respond to these circumstances, okay? We're not under the covenant. But in Isaiah chapter 1, the issue here is that they need to, to get things right in their life unless God will judge them, right? That's the covenant situation, all right? Back to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead the widow is what he says. And uh, we'll stop here in verse 18, but... There's a lot you can teach in verse 16 and 17 about what is right, because essentially he's quoting the law here. He's saying you need to, to judge the fatherless. You need to uh, relieve the oppressed, plead the widow. Okay? There's a debate with people in our culture about how, to op how governments and justice should be given. Right? And one way people think about what is right and what is wrong is to say that there's a right or there's something that is successful and then there's something that is wrong or something that is a failure, right? And so there's right and there's wrong. And the two are very, very different. And we need to judge between right and wrong. And we need to know what is the most successful, successful what's the greatest thing, what's the sign of, of greatness and the things that are the worst and things that are least, right? And so we have people competing with each other to do things that are right and to do great things. And at the top, people put what they're trying to attain. They put what their God is. Right? And so we have the godly and the ungodly. And in our culture, they put things up here like money. So the more money you get, the more righteous you are. And this is the idea, the more successful you are. The less money you have, the more failure you are. Right? This is one God people put up here. Another God may be health. Right? So you have wealth, you have health. So the more healthy you are, the greater you are. The less healthy you are, the worse you are. Right? Or what about this? Fun, right? The more fun adventure you have, the more successful and right you are. And the least fun that you have, the more miserable and failure that you are. So there's like this separation of the haves and the have-nots in our society based upon what people are trying to serve. Okay? And because of this inequity, inequity, the Bible talks about inequity, right? Inequity, this separation, there's another group of people who say, this is wrong having this inequity in money and health and entertainment and fun and, and outcome, right? We need to have everyone equal. Everyone needs to have the same amount of money and the same amount of health, the same amount of fun. Everyone gets it, right? We need to look at the oppressed and look at the widow and the failure and those that are wrong. And, and everyone should be equal. And so trying to flatten this thing down so everyone should be equal. There is no right and wrong. There is no success and failure. Everybody's the same, right? And there's corruption in society, folks. The corruption is when you put these things up here at the top. There's corruption. This is what the right does. They put these things at the top. There's corruption, right? They put justice up here as, a, a, as something they worship. Criminality, right? Good behavior. They say, well, criminals deserve ultimate justice. And we never committed a crime. We're perfect citizens, right? This is what the right does. What's the left do? They look at the oppressed, and they look at the failure, and they look at the people who need stuff and say, we need those things, right? How, do the, how does the left get corrupt? They tend to profane this stuff. And they tend to steal from everyone else. How does the right get messed up? They tend to make things God that are not God. The right way to handle society, folks, is this. You put God at the top. You put man at the bottom, right? So the more godly you are, the more right you are, right? The less godly you are, the less right you are. And guess what? All of humanity is not right. And so there's an equity among all of us. All of us are sinners. But there's still a right and a wrong. There's godliness, there's holiness, and then there's us, right? And how do you help the oppressed and relieve the, uh, the, the, the oppressed and help the widow and all that? How do you do that? Well, when people have power or they have money or they have health or whatnot, they know that's not their God. God is their God. And God says, help those people. So you have godly people in power with money and health and, and time, and they are able to help those who don't. That's godly government, folks, right? It's a godly society. What's the problem? No one's really godly. <laughs> so you got corruption on high, you got corruption on low, corruption everywhere. And this is what Israel's facing the same problem. 
God says to Israel, he says, you need to relieve the oppressed, judge the fathers, plead the widow, because people had money in the temple and they had access to things in the temple. They, they were the self-righteous ones and weren't helping anybody, right? And then others were stealing from people, right? Others were profaning God, saying God isn't the issue, right? This is what the left does, folks. Why do you think the left supports abortion and the left supports homosexual marriage? Because the things God puts as valuable, they profane in order to allow everyone access to whatever they want, right? If marriage is only between a man and a woman, it's a holy matrimony, the left goes, there's nothing holy, right? If life is valuable, preserved at all costs, the left says, not necessarily, right? Do what you want. What the left is trying to do is deal with every man. You know what the left always does? It's always in the name of every man's helping, whatever every man wants. So what's the righteous left supposed to do? It's good to help every man. Don't steal and don't profane. What's the right supposed to do? It's good that there's holy and things that are untouchable and there's right and there's wrong and there's justice. Make sure you don't make these things your God. Make God your God or else you'll be self-righteous and you won't help anybody. Right? That's the balance, folks. That's the scriptural response to the politics that we're having that's going on. Both sides think they're entirely right. And guess what? Both sides are wrong. And both sides have an element of truth. Right? But what do you call half-truths? Lies. <laughs> it's like we had a problem. Right? It's like Israel back in Isaiah 1. They had political problems. They had societal problems. And the result was always because of sin. Do you see why I see the importance of Bible study and scripture? Because it deals with our sin. Our societal problems and cultural and political problems come from individual spiritual problems. Right? There's nothing more critical to our national functioning than spiritual growth and edification. Right? And so, yeah, I think it's important for churches to meet to do the right thing to study the Bible rightly divided. Right? It'll help relieve your fear. It'll help strengthen you spiritually. It helps strengthen your understanding of what's going on. And it affects everything else in society. Right? I read the other day, people are dealing with staying home, and now that everyone's staying home, right? Because it's for the safety of everybody. You know, help every man, right? Safety of everybody, stay home, protect everybody. Well, that's a good, a good motivation, a good intent. But at what cost would be a question to ask, right? You know, and, and people are staying home, or forcing them to stay home, and they're having another problem. What's the other problem they're having? It's psychological. I would call it spiritual. I read an article the other day saying how to psychologically deal with the isolation, loneliness, and fear when you're at home watching TV all the time. I'm like, wow. That sounds like they need some church. Sounds like they need some spiritual help. They call it psychological, right? So follow these psychological, scientifically proven steps to increase your mental state while you're at home staring at a wall and reading the coronavirus all the time. Right? Turn off the TV, say some prayers, have the peace of God, learn God's truth, know who he's made you, know how, what happens after you die, know the value of your life, and for some people you might make the choice to sacrifice or risk your life for the sake of helping someone else. Woo! You mean I'm not staying home? Not if that guy needs help, because I love my neighbor. Right? That's valuable. But it's also a good thing not to hurt your neighbor by coughing on him. <laughs> That's bad. Right? So, see, there's, 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 there's a sound mind and a righteous thinking to some of these things. And when people operate with imbalance or inequity in their understanding, they tend to cause more problems. Right? And so, this is what Isaiah is talking about. You're offering sacrifices. Jesus said you offer the tithes. And that's well. Jesus said, do that. The only time in the New Testament it talks about tithes that you should do it, Jesus says, Matthew 23, 23, give the tithes. Right? I'm not talking to you, by the way. But he says, give the tithes, but don't omit the weightier matters, faith, mercy, and love. Right? Because that's the whole point. And if you, don't, if you don't keep that, you're deserving a judgment. So Isaiah 1, he says that you should judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, relieve the oppressed. You should give it things with the right heart. So if you're going to be righteous, do it with the right heart because God sees your heart. And also help everybody approach God because that's the whole point of being a priest class. Right? The whole point of being the chosen ones of God in the Old Testament was to help everyone else understand God. And they were not doing that. Right? So there's problems on the top, problem on the bottom. Right? And what's God do? You know, he dies on a cross, right, with his feet on the ground, with his head looked up to heaven, right, with his arms around everybody. This is, this is the picture of the cross. Okay? So it's very interesting how, how God has put these things together. In verse 18, we'll cover next week. It says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. One of the most popular passages in Isaiah. You've heard this before, right? 
Though your sins be scarlet, they should be white as snow. Sounds very much like New Testament teaching, like even grace teaching. We'll deal with some of this next week because it's a bigger topic. But uh, he's teaching here salvation. He's teaching of all their sins, God can make your red, sinful, bloody, stained sins white. Now the question he does not answer in this verse is how he's going to do that. Right? Where in that verse does he say how he's going to do it? He doesn't. He just says he's going to do it. He's going to make your scarlet sins white as wool. Right? How? We don't know. That's part of the mystery, folks, is that what was not said back there. God promised salvation throughout. How he would accomplish it and give it freely to us was not something that was revealed throughout. Okay? So there was always a hope given, but not always explained how God would accomplish it. You have the benefit of knowing how God can make your sins white as snow through the finished work of Christ, and not just make your sins white as snow, but make you a new creature in Christ, which is far greater. Right? So we understand some of that truth. Uh, like I said, we'll stop here for today, and we'll pick up uh, the rest of the chapter next week. I'm sorry I didn't finish it once again. Uh, today, chapter 1 is very meaty, and uh, so uh, I thought I might split it up into thirds, and that's probably what's going to happen. So we'll do the third section next week, dealing with God's judgment. Okay? Any comments or questions about Isaiah 1? We had a lot of learning back there in the Old Testament about culture and society. All right, let's pray. God, we're thankful for the wisdom you provide in your book and that all Scripture is profitable for us. I pray that we would be equipped through an understanding of your word, profiting from the rebuke that you gave to Israel, the correction you give them, that we may better appreciate your grace today and that also we'll have the wisdom to deal with things in our society with wisdom and discernment and judgment and understanding. We thank you for your word, which is perfect, even though we're not. And we thank you for the Lord who saved us when we didn't deserve it. Amen.